So next speaker is, I'm just going to call you the big chief of the Milan studio of Fjord. Uh, design and innovation from Accenture Interactive. 20 years global experience. And you're all about inventing. The, I think there's a really nice sentence. Inventing the future at the intersection of design, innovation, and brand communication. If you walk into a boardroom like that and you say that, you're going to get all the money in the world. Uh, we met before, I don't know if you remember, in the Prague event. I think it was last uh, week. Yeah. All right. Indeed. There you go. I, le I left some sort of impression. I really loved it. I also, you also gave me a Fjord Trends Report book. I read it completely on the plane and then gave it to my wife. Uh, true story. And she also <laughs> enjoyed it. It was beautifully designed. It was really simply explained on what the opportunities were across the industry. You're going to talk today. It's very simple. Fjord Trends 2020, the COVID edition, because you have a trends report and then something happens that nobody can predict. COVID hits, the world changes, but there's still so much opportunity out there. So many trends that are changing, people reinventing themselves and their businesses. That's what you're going to talk about. So, Ashley, take it away. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the, the energizing intro there. And, uh, and, and hello to everyone who is uh, obviously kind of tuning into this this morning. And as you said, yes, yeah, so a look a bit of how uh, things are, are, are changing every year. Uh, for the last 13 years as Fjord, we've been putting together, and let me start sharing my screen, but we've been, um, you know, compiling really signals that we're seeing. So trends, not that are far away and a distant, but signals from what is happening um, and, uh, and, and changing now. And, and they get compiled around this time of the year. Uh, across about 33 studios around the world. So we're looking at those kind of commonalities that could be coming to life in the next 12 months or so. So, you know, head in the clouds, but, you know, feet well on a, on a changing ground at the moment in, in, in understanding how we use these. And, and these trends are also not just wanting to be theory. Uh, they're very much tools that we apply in practice. So um, in projects, we have activities like trends reframing, where they give us then, if you want, you know, parameters and against which to measure what we're doing. Uh, and as you'll see, you'll also see in this deck, we, we always look to try and make it actionable. So give uh, elements of what to be, uh, you know, thinking or doing uh, around. But of course, you know, uh, January, these came out and two months later, uh, as you said, I'm speaking from Milan. So we were unfortunately early adopters for once uh, and have now been you know, sitting at home speaking since then. So COVID came along and has really, you know, changed things dramatically. You know, you have a global crisis, which unfortunately is still unfolding. If we look at Europe, you know, our the curves are starting to, you know, have an uptake. Uh, but this has, you know, had lasting impact now beyond us getting out of a COVID crisis. Those impacts are profound. We're seeing them on the change for just to give one example on how we're changing our way of, you know, working from home or not only office and how that will remain to a certain extent. So now that's then redesigning um, our cities. But essentially, um, we always have a, a, a meta trend at the start, something that we look to be able to uh, connect and bring all the dots together. And this was realigning the fundamentals. And this, as I said, was again before COVID. So, you know, we saw climate change happening at a faster space, more people being conscious of this happening. You know, there's been rising inequality, big tech, a lot of, you know, elements that point to crisis and as it says here of course not wanting to paint a gloomy picture because these moments are moments also of reinvention and what is needed is to really be embracing a long-term view and how that impacts if you want on on the world and and society at, um, at large we have seven trends we're going to touch on today so without talking you through the titles we can uh, dive right in. Uh, and the first here was called The Many Faces of Growth. And, um, and this was seen how corporate transformation, which has been driven by, you know, digital in these last few years, has started to switch to purpose. And in that sense, it's saying, how do we look beyond, say, 
financial metrics to be able to measure the success, the, uh, the pleasure the, what are, that we are doing, you know, the learning that comes uh, from that. Uh, and of course, this, this realigning, um, this many faces of growth with COVID has come again under something that has had a, a, you know, a faster impact. We started judging organizations and individuals really based on, on their response. And you know, we're, this is still occurring now. We, we look at not only companies, we look at our governments and how they have reacted on that uh, two elements. So there's this big shift there. And it's been very practical in times, like when back during the lockdown, there were companies that, you know, changed their production lines to be, if they're larger things, creating ventilators or smaller companies like in Italy that were producing grappa, started making hand sanitizers. Uh, and of course, and, you know, on the opposite side, we're seeing rise in unemployment, which is really spiking. So there's big considerations really for companies that are also at the same time needing to balance their, 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 their balance sheets and make that happen. Because we were really seeing this idea of, um, you know, capitalism in a way needing to, to, to rethink itself. And this is coming, as you can see here, from, for example, the Financial Times. And it's saying, you know, business must make a profit, of course, but it should serve a purpose too. Uh, or a quote from, you know, CEO of, of, of Salesforce around bringing a new form that is more sustainable and where businesses are maybe not just looking at their shareholders, but at their wider stakeholders and you know there's in kind of uh, intense being signed groups of companies including accenture that are subscribing to these years just like to sustainability uh programs we've just announced star kind of uh zero emissions by 2025 and we're seeing a really in how we think of growth and again i think this has even been accelerated by covid but a, a lot of the darlings of the digital world, Uber, uh, think of WeWork, Peloton, as they went into IPOs, they no longer seem to have that simple strength that they were driving uh, previous IPOs from big brands. And then, you know, on the other side, uh, as this came under attack, we saw things like, you know, countries like New Zealand unveiling a well-being budget that was, yes, looking at economic growth, so, you know, GDP elements, but also what makes it a great place to live, you know, and how do you drive the life? And interestingly, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand just in the last few weeks has been, you know, talking, you know, possibility of a four week uh, working uh, day and how that can change. And there's been experiments happening there. Microsoft, who were just on, but in Japan run uh, a, a pilot in, on a four day week and they actually saw their production increase as their working hours went down. So we're saying it's a time to really examine, we're seeing in this moment of crisis, that all the beliefs that we hold and, uh, and you know, also a way of giving meaning and metrics. So, so, so adding to those economic models, it can be learning, it can be happiness, it can be your communal longevity. And of course, for businesses, it's a challenge and it's not an indifferent challenge is as I said, finding if you want these purposeful objectives while, of course, maintaining profit and, and a healthy business to allow that, that purpose to take place. I was saying, it's, it's, it's time how will you, you know, rethink your customer experience, but also your employee experience, you know, and how do they can kind of work together to create value. And, uh, you know, COVID here in having remoted made work remote again, you know, how does value, new value come out on, uh, on, on that side? And if we go on to the second, uh, it's called money changes. And then here it was really looking at all the signals coming at different speeds from different countries, really on how money is changing. So it's moving from bringing something physical, something tangible that you, you hold in your hands to more and more being you know, zeros and ones. So a file, a digital file. And, and, and what does that mean? What does that implicate? And again, COVID gave a big acceleration to this, especially during that initial lockdown period when, well, money was seen, physical money was seen as being contagious. Uh, so there was a big push, even from people that didn't, to actually go towards using digital tools, you know, preferably contactless. I see it in my little stores here in Milan. Before, they would have always wanted cash. 
that change happen. And just reading a couple of days ago in uh, Wired UK, there was an article called The Pandemic Has Killed Cash. And there was an interesting statistic in that where it's saying that during the pandemic in the UK, 9,000 uh, ATMs have been disconnected from the network. So not only money disappearing, physical money, but also the network that was allowing that to happen. And uh, so what is taking, you know, its place is, of course, in, in premise, we're seeing, you know, a new form of uh, fintechs and, and, and digital attackers from in the top right, Manise, which is allowing you, if you're thinking, to run, you know, euros and maybe pounds, sterling accounts. So for Europeans to manage cross borderline to start but also to players like Apple or Google moving into that financial space and a uh, Quote here of, uh, from Sweden, where only 13% seem to remember using cash for a, for a purchase. So this new mental model, as we also mean, you know, going to digital, into crypto, potentially into cryptocurrencies, is how does that change our way of thinking of, uh, of, of money? So this mental model becomes, as I said, from something physical to a, a file. And, and if you want, think of it like in, uh, back in the days of when we went from what could have been a vinyl uh, piece of music that all it had on it was the music to 20, 30 years later, as we have, you know, our music on MP3, stuff on Spotify, it carries a whole more information than simply the music that it is there. So within, um, you know, this, this space, it's like going, how can you then really start thinking of money transactions in a different way? The kind of thing it's saying, you know, if every payment carries information about you or your customers, what would that be? So, if you're a railway and uh, I'm a student and I go and buy my ticket, maybe it recognizes my being a student and I have automatically my discount that is entailed as a, a banal example. But this it, putting information in cash again can really open up a whole series of, of services and that don't necessarily come. From need to come from the financial services world, and um, and this change in, uh, in in managing our cash, uh, you know, biometrics start playing more and more of a role. Takes us to this third trend, which is called walking barcodes, and essentially how both with kind of five G now being rolled out, so we have more data that can flow more rapidly. This is you know this faster data connection really. Uh, and, and tools that get disseminated, digital tools in physical environment, are making more and more possible this kind of body, facial and body recognition. And in fact, going back to payments, you know, Alibaba in, um, in, uh, in, in China, which is kind of the equivalent of Amazon in some of its stores, you can pay by a smile as it recognizes you. So, and again, you know, what happens with COVID? Where is the lens there? Uh, you know, we've been looking and, at how we can monitor, you know, that digital barcode. How can we keep, you know, track and trace here? And it's worked better in some countries as others. UK recently had a big scandal around uh, Excel being used as a database, you know, as a, um, but uh, we're seeing this rise across countries on how we can be using our ways of then kind of minimizing uh, pandemic that is happening. And of course, within this, what we need to do as always is balance those privacy issues with the benefit ones. So how do we ensure that there is trust in who is using these services, but again, can put us in that beneficial place of having that information that can be shared, that can help us contrast things like pandemics, but not only that, a whole series of improvements. Because if you want, we're moving towards what we could call the body as our signature. Uh, both the digital tools we interact with, if we think of, uh, you know, Alexa and its uh, voice control, it's getting smaller and smaller, as you can see by here, it becomes jewelry, there is some bearing as a ring, or in pre-pandemic times when we were still flying, uh, you know, places like Gatwick were introducing, but also Nati in Milan, uh, pre-flight facial recognition, ID tests, so... Uh, Really, we're moving from, we've been talking of Internet of Things in these last few years. More and more, we're seeing also a new world of Internet of Bodies and how 
you know, living services, so services that can respond to us, that understand us, are going from a digital world into that physical one. And the key to this change is learning, if you want, from uh, data mistakes that were made in digital world. Because as you can imagine, one thing is if someone hacks uh, my, uh, my email account, okay, I have to change my, my, my password, if my, you know, my fingerprint gets hacked somehow, that's a lot more difficult for me to, to kind of go in and replace. So uh, again, there's an element of datamalism, which if you've heard past trends, we have spoken about. And again, that strong element of, of, of consent that needs to come in uh, to this. But again, to the left, if we then think, you know, it is also again, opening up a whole world of services that can be unlocked by biometrics. You know, we have even here element of facial recognition. So perhaps if you're calling an emergency, it recognizes that there is that, that you know, urgency in your voice and it can help then uh, put your call through a lot faster. And in this changing, you know, as we walk around as walking barcodes, we're all dissolving in a way. Um, and into what we're calling for this year, kind of liquid, liquid people where, what does it mean? You know, we all wear a series of, um, of, of, of hats in our lives, we have our professional life as an employee. Uh, you know, we are consumers in what we go out and we buy and we use. We are parents, we can be educators, we can be, you know, sons and daughters of people. But all these identities somehow have, again, come into discussion. And COVID, once again, through a moment of lockdown, has accelerated or exacerbated this. So it has both seen behavior change. Here is mentioned, you know, hand washing, uh, working from home or old habits like that toilet paper hoarding at the start of lockdown, which was very bizarre. But it continues now between who wears masks and who doesn't and how do we, how do we confront different things. And, and it made us rethink priorities, what was important or not. So, and this again said it, put itself into a, an existing trend, really, of revaluating elements around us. So a rising consciousness of climate change uh, took to these new uh, to consumption. Uh, and here an example comes from Sweden, where this word flickscam came into being, of people saying, oh, no, you should be, you know, embarrassed of, of, of flying because of its impact on, uh, on the climate. And as you can see, it has very, uh, let's say, tangible repercussions in a business world. There was 8% fall, this is said, pre-COVID uh, statistics in airport passengers. And wow, 2 million extra on trains. So whole ecosystems that get redesigned uh, this way. And in this world of liquid people, even things like the Impossible Burger, which is this new generation of uh, non-meat burgers, is not actually eaten just by, you know, vegans or vegetarians, but 95% of people buying them in the US are meat eaters and they've shifted to something. Or we're seeing in the top right, you know, the first gender fluid uh, dolly arriving from, from a big producer like Mattel or a change in work that is taking more and more to freelancing. So here, you know, if we think that this, this kind of COVID-19 has accelerated what purpose means and what is that personal element to it, creating more anxiety and ethical ones. It's even health anxiety in these moments. And not to think of it necessarily as a generational shift. This is not coming just from young people. It's something that you can see in people in their 60s, like in people that are middle-aged or, or in teens. So it's going, how do you then think if you're a company on uh, or designed to help your brand define people beyond the, what they can sum, they consume or how they work? Uh, and, and how to so think of people more roundly. This uh, In the middle, it says strike the word consumer from your vocabulary. Well, uh, we're saying it's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's a change in mindset and thinking wider in, in, in who we are. And the fifth one, as we uh, go on is called designing intelligence. It takes us back to the tools uh, we use. And, and of course, artificial intelligence has now been with us in uh, especially in automizing um, activities for a few years. And uh, it's been playing a key role 
post-pandemic, both in helping us, if you want, you know, kind of provide um, ideas of how this can, can evolve. So predictions and forecasting on how an epidemic can spread. But very importantly, and we see all the whole series of vaccines that are currently under testing across a variety of company, countries that are, you know, strongly supported by AI research that is allowing to really crunch through that kind of, you know, protein structures, etc. So then this seems from what has been, as I said, that embedding of an AI that has disappeared into our background. So Google Lens, and I can look at a flower and it can tell me what it is, or my skincare products that are uh, uh, you know, being designed by an AI to be fully fitted to the kind of skin type that I have, um, are sitting there in the background. But what we're seeing happening now is actually this kind of move to a new stage for AI that moves from information to value creation and essentially helps us navigate times that are becoming you know, increasingly complex. So seeing uh, AI tools being used in boardrooms at the moment, or, you know, or as tools for CEOs there to, to be making decisions that are, that are gonna augment what they can, that we can as humans. Or we're seeing AI being you know, adopted to actual design practice. Those seats that you see down there in the left corner is a collaboration between Philip Stark and then an algorithm. And then we have things like AlphaStar that are pushing the boundaries through gaming here, but actually helping solve kind of problems when there is incomplete information. And this again would be a big step forward to, to kind of challenge those real um, business challenges. So we have highlighted, if you want, three areas where we see that uh, a systemic and new approach to AI that can help, how can we say, unleash and unlock full potential human creation uh, of these, you know, one is this enhancing the human experience by extending our perceptual abilities. You know, second is how do you empower people in complex systems, especially in global organizations? And, you know, then how can we envision new products and services that we can prototype we want through simulation and, 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 and support in that uh, decision making? So, again, a lot of thought here, really, as I said, is what role AI and how that can help, as I said, not just in automizing individual tasks, but providing more strategic making decision. And as I said, and in even in enhancing and augmenting us, both as organizations and people. Because that kind of takes us on um, to the sixth trend here, which is, you know, digital doubles and, um, and, and how more and we are um, becoming, our, our personas have a life of their own on, uh, online. And, and we already exist in a way through the things that we post on Instagram, that we leave on social media, but here it's starting to take, you know, more of a, nearly of a 3D form. And of course, these digital doubles now have been accelerated or this adoption of needing avatars of some sort online, even by people who were resistant before again, driven by remote working, by lockdowns of actually learning to use these tools or to be taking a lot of their medical resources online. Uh, and these twins, and as we've also uh, told in, in previous years in trends, when we were looking like at synthetic realities, uh, is the possibility really of, of, of having 3D and data models of physical objects. These are both people, but we can also think of products with digital doubles. Uh, a lot of the work we have been doing this year has been creating virtual experiences uh, that provided this, this second life of, 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 of sorts for 2020. Um, and then of course, if, if we're looking on yeah, yeah, that that can take, just like people are digital double, also has you know, a soul, and that soul is made up of our data. So key to this in, in being able to express ourselves more through avatars is uh, online is where does our data reside and how do we control uh, that so that uh, what we, we, we can then grow, if you want, even through AI, our assistance that can help us automize on, 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 certain, on certain elements. 
since these digital doubles can rewrite data ownership models. Again, this is something, and it's really here, critical question as often, like we go back to the, to, to, to the cash earlier, is who do I trust to host my digital double? So again, for most organizations here, uh, there's kind of key considerations on how you can be designing and, and, and helping build uh, trust on what you're doing. So again, you know, I said here, it's thinking if you think through what categories of interactions, you know, we could be opening up by digital doubles, that it could be delegating tasks for you. So the more mundane things that need doing, uh, it can be doing for you. It can maybe masquerade your presence. Maybe it's a digital double giving you this presentation now. Or, or interestingly, it's how can you use it to model behaviors or elements and how they can play out in the, in the, in the future. So the last uh, trend of this, and often it's more of a design-focused one, here, but it, it takes us back to the very start, I think, and to the many phases of growth, to that, very, to that first trend on how we look, if you want, beyond a narrower view and we take a more uh, systemic view on what is around us. So uh, we have spoken for years of user-centered design and we continue to do that. We continue to put our user at the center, but we need to then now, if you want to have a layer in which we need to think of the life and the world that that user inhabits, so that this becomes, if you want, a life-centered design. And this shift, and again, I think this is very much still a, an activity ongoing based on post-pandemic, uh, new lockdowns may be coming into play or not, but uh, an acceleration from a me to a we. So back in early days of lockdown, when people were coming out and showing support for their medical staff, or they were sharing in Italy, like old ladies used to do, of taking their baskets down for their shopping to be pulled up to their, to their flats, of leaving food in there for who needed them, people to take uh, this. So we're seeing, if you want, you know, if you we all work with kind of that Venn diagrams of desirability, feasibility, and viability. And as we've looked at the desirability for end users, you know, for its business feasibility, for how we do this, um, you know, what becomes here is that move and to look at it in a wider way uh, so that we are taking systemic views on its impact on, uh, you know, on the environment, which ultimately impacts us as a society on things. And, and these changes, again, are paying off. If we think back to liquid people, and how they're changing uh, our, our way of, uh, of defining ourselves. The example you see up here that comes from Dr. Martins, uh, those are vegan boots, and they're not ever. Uh, and the response, if you want, to a, a changing need can also help them uh, not only use leather, but uh, open up a whole new market. So they saw sales go up by uh, quite interesting double, double digits. So again, here, big, big challenges that, that face us at the end is that if we are in the business of producing physical goods, it's how do we change what are kind of very complex supply chains and manufacturing processes? How do we, you know, readapt those so that their demand is more for the purposeful products and services that we've kind of touched on in these earlier trends? And, you know, in digital, so I think a lot of the work I've been doing in Primus is how do we change that, you know, instead of having constant engagement and, uh, you know, self-service with, with digital services that actually respect more the time or the attention, although they're more attuned. So all this, if you want, design needs to, to adjust, needs to change. And uh, we all really need, I think, to broaden an understanding that then looks uh, at entire systems, as I said, not just meeting personal. So... And I said to bring this together is um, said redefining these three elements, uh, understanding how we can, uh, as I said, practice as much as possible and to do no harm in, in, in the growth that we seek. And, and last but very not least, in these complex times, you know, we need collaboration and interdisciplinary scope. That's where answers come from. So more and more. 
uh, as we're doing, for example, in, in Accenture Interactive uh, and, and living this out, bringing a lot of uh, different skill sets to the table in, in, in highly blended teams that can help uh, respond to these many challenges that we face. And on that, I will say thank you. I believe with two minutes spare, and I'll stop sharing. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. Nice. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm looking at uh, me in the meanwhile, like we have a 13 second delay on uh, what I'm seeing. But in the meanwhile, the first claps, the digital claps are coming in. The people enjoyed thank it. You. So that's good. Also, some person is not really a question, but some person is saying uh, that he says crypto. Yes. Uh, crypto, no, but the CBDC uh, will be the future. Um, as I'm sharing some links on, 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 on what you're doing. So I'm just waiting what, what's coming in. Everybody's right. clapping. So it's always fun if you can't see it for the speaker. No, no, it is because it is pretty bizarre to be yeah. just kind of speaking to a screen. And there, uh, there you go. Exactly. That. Slightly different from a real life experience talking of, uh, of a changing world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all, we all, no matter how how much and what that we're in technology and in future trends, it's it's adapting for everybody, like you said, and it's going to continue to change with everything. Um, in the meantime, what do you think is? Uh, of course, you don't have a class ball to predict the future, uh, but what do you think that we're gonna evolve to if you look at all these trends? To give you an example, um, yeah, it's a bit like. People say that people don't click on banners, but they actually do click. So I know I can't represent just my country. But if I look at Belgium, the moment that uh, lockdown and everything was a bit smoother, like we're going back to a bit to the old normal, you immediately saw people jumping in their cars, the roads getting stuck again, traffic. What do you think in general people will, will, will do? Will these trends continue or will people go back to the, the old normal? Oh, well, that, that, that's a very good question. And I, and I think, you know, we're, we're living through a moment where it changes nearly from week to week. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing we've run here out of Italy has been an observatory where we're talking to people, but we're going back in every two, three months because I think, yes, you're right. If I think back to the summer, there was a moment that our memory went quite short term. Yeah. And, and, and everything started going fuzzy. Did we really live through that? or not, yeah? And unfortunately, again, now, I think we're gonna be rediscovering some, some truths or not as, as, as this curve goes up and how we're, how we're confronting it. So uh, really, definitely not a time for, for, for crystal balls because it is unprecedented times. I think the importance, Brian, to keep a longer view on yeah. things. You know, and, 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 and look, which is very difficult, more systemically, as we do, on how, on how things interconnect. Uh, That's true, true. And, we and as I said, it, me, it, it, I, I think I probably say it a lot of times, but when I think of crisis, it was a Chinese ideogram that crisis is also the same for opportunities. So I think... That's true. That let's look at those, yeah, and how we maybe push from that me to we. In yeah, and that's true. I don't know who said it, probably in a movie somewhere, but never waste <laughs> a crisis. That's what they always say. And we have to decontaminate our crystal balls if we, if we, if we have them. Last question for you. Um, you presented the trends. It's what you do on a daily, checking what, what, is, what is, like you said, inventing at the intersection. But what personally is for you the number one? If you have to choose of everything what you're seeing these days, what are you most excited about for the, for the future? What is your personal... Uh, preference in the um, I, I, I think it's really the, the, the meta trend at the start, this idea of realigning fundamentals. So it, it's, it's, it's going through, it's a really, it's a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and that can give moments of being scary, but others you're going, wow, it's, yeah. uh, we, we definitely live in interesting times. And I think, you know, not so much predicting because you can't, but you can contribute towards inventing something that, yes. That is that is true. I totally agree with that. You can look at it pessimistically or optimistically. And if you look at it optimistically, you will always see that there's a very interesting and very exciting shift uh, happening. Or, or, or simply realistically, this is what we have. You know, as, as yeah. it's always like design, you have to work with a set of conditions. How do you make, how do you turn those to the best? Not true. Thank you very much, Ashley. Our time is up. Thank meanwhile, you. Meanwhile, things are still coming in, applauding, and people are also reading nah. the polls. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, Ciao da Milano. Have a good continuation, guys. Thank you very much. It Bye. Was great. Cheers.